Hey, everybody. Welcome to episode 136 of WP Roundtable. I'm Kyle Maurer, and today I have a very special guest. Mr. Scott Bullinger is joining me on the show. Scott is the founder of AppPressor. He's done a lot of cool stuff in the WordPress community. He's a real awesome guy, and we're going to learn about him. How are you doing today, Scott? Doing good. Thanks for having me here. I appreciate you joining me. You've been on my wish list for guests for quite some time, and just finally got around to scheduling that. And I'm pretty excited about our discussion today. Should be good. It's going to be sweet. So let's dive into our quick picks of the week right off the bat. It's a part of the show where we just share something interesting that we've discovered recently or that we're really into and we want to just let the world know all about. So one of my uh, best friends in the community, John James Jacoby, just started a new project called pluginsloaded.com. It's pretty sweet. He was asking for some feedback, so I'm sharing that. Take a look at it. It lists a lot of plugins that he's made, and they're pretty top-notch. So that's uh, my first quick pick. And then you know my second, because I sometimes like to throw in a second, is a little blog post called WordCamps on John Parkinson blog. John is a good friend and uh, he wrote some some thoughts uh, about his experience with WordCamps. So check that out. Scott, do you have something to share? Yeah, well you mentioned that I could share about beer. So um, I actually, I really like IPAs and there's a, a semi newish IPA by Stone Brewing called Tangerine Express that I really like. And um, it's not super new, it's been out for a few months, but it's really good and it's fairly cheap. So um, I, as far as like IPAs go, so check that one out. That's awesome, man. Uh, Stone produces some pretty good stuff pretty consistently. So Tangerine Express, I'm gonna have to check that out. I love IPAs myself. Yep, yeah, and Stone started not too far from me, about an hour from me, so I get to go down there and check them out. I've, been a fan for a while, but definitely good stuff if you like IPAs. Oh, I love it. I love it. All right. Thank you for sharing. Let's learn about your background a little bit, Scott. Let's dive into that if we can. I want to know kind of how you got where you are a little bit. And we can we can take this in a little bit in a couple of couple of stages. I started at the beginning of your career before you really had any any job or anything um, developing or for you're doing anything on the web, you had a, a plan, a vision, some ambitions for something to do with your life and you were excited about trying to do it. What is it that you were excited about and how did you get started? Yeah, man, I feel like I don't have as grand of a vision for my own life as some people do. Like maybe they're, they, they have sort of like, man, in 10 years I want to be doing this and this and I here's my plan, here's how I'm going to execute it. Like, I just am not good at doing that. So um, I'm, I'm better at kind of what's just right in front of me. So when I, I actually, I went to college and, and I was a music major. I studied jazz guitar. And then out of college, I uh, sold boats, which makes a lot of sense, right? And then, um, <laughs> and then eventually, now, you know, now I'm in uh, web work. So um, I, I started like kind of hacking on websites uh, really terribly for my boat company that I was at. And they kind of went under during the financial crisis in, in 2008. And then I just kind of went out on my own and, and learned a lot more about graphic design and um, actually got a job as a graphic designer. And that kind of turned into web designer because they just needed a lot of web stuff done and just learned um, how to do it kind of as I went and um, did it really, really poorly to begin with and just kind of got better over time. And um, then uh, I kind of went off and decided to do some freelance client work and found out uh, pretty quickly that I'm not really that excited about client work. And, <laughs> <laughs> and instead of dealing with clients, I would much rather be like writing code, building cool stuff. And so I really wanted to start a product business, but I was not a developer of, of any sort at the time. I was more of like a designer. So um, ended up actually... Uh, kind of finding a partner to do a theme company with. And that was uh, in like 2010. Started a theme company and um, went okay for a few years and then um, sort of fell apart. And um, that's kind of when I had the idea for AppPressor and started that up um, about three and a half years ago or so. Do you still play any guitar? I do, although not as much. 
So now they're, they're kind of packed away and, you know, not, I don't play them as much, unfortunately. That's pretty awesome. You know, it's funny after I've interviewed uh, as many people as we've had on this show uh, in the past three years, uh, everybody's got their own path to end up where they are. Uh, there's none of them are the same, but yeah. I've been surprised at how many music majors there were. Oh, really? How yeah, many? Quite a few. <laughs> That's because there's no money in music and we all had to figure out something else to do. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're right. And they, there's something to that. People, a lot of homeless people and web designers are music <laughs> me. <laughs> uh, there's something to that. Yeah. So uh, when he started the theme company, uh, what was your role? What, what sort of parts were you playing? I was doing like design and marketing. Oh, okay. Uh, um, yeah, and then uh, over the years, I... Um, after starting out presser and everything, my role has slowly transitioned into developer, and now I am um, full on developer. Um, and and it's weird because I didn't start out that way. I had no intention of doing that, but I found that that's where the need was in all of my the things that I was doing. I just I had to build like stuff had to be built, and there wasn't always people around who could build it quickly or inexpensively. And so I just learned to do it myself because I was impatient and, um, you know, just kind of frustrated. So, that, and, and do, you know, doing that for years and years and eventually you become pretty good at it. So that's kind of where I am now. You know, that's uh, another theme that I've seen a lot is the uh, reluctant, at least initially, developer, uh, someone who learns by necessity, not because they have a particular interest, not because that's, what they identify as as, as the the programmer, uh, right. but just ends up there, and that was very similar to my story as well. I, it wasn't what I wanted to do. In fact, there was a time where I explicitly said, "I don't want to. I don't want to be a programmer. I'm not interested, uh, but I have to because there's no one else to do this work, and it's what our clients want." Yep, it's just how it turns out sometimes. Does the theme company still exist? Yeah, it does. Um, it's called Press Coders. Um, so yeah, still out there. That's pretty cool. Awesome, awesome. Uh, do you still participate in the business in any way? Uh, not really, no. Uh, cool. Just totally dedicated, one hundred and ten percent to AppPressor. Yep, I've I've been doing AppPressor full time uh, pretty much since since we launched um, about three and a half years ago. Three and a half years ago, so mid to late twenty. 14, 13, 13, 14, was it 2013 or 13, 14? I think maybe it was, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know off the top of my head to be honest. Okay. Well, our things change fast in our industry. Maybe give us a quick snapshot of what the landscape looked like at that time and why you thought it's, it's ripe for starting a business just like this. I, I, you know, I, I didn't sort of a uh, special insight that anyone else at the time, I just kind of thought that doing mobile apps and WordPress sounded cool. And I was, at the time, I was like, thing to do and a business to start. And I was just that idea that I just was got real passionate and excited about. And I just was like, I like nobody's doing this and I'm going to figure it out. I'm going to do it because I'm excited about it. And um, I didn't really like, I didn't do any market research. I didn't like say this is a, a ripe time in the industry. It was just like, this sounds cool. I'm going to try it. <laughs> <You know? laughs> wow. like, I, I, that's kind of like a theme, uh, you know, in a lot of the things that I do. And I, I don't think it's a good thing. Like, I don't think other people should do it that way. But that's just kind of horrible sometimes. So I'm trying to get better at like more like market research and being more professional and things. But um, <laughs> Kind of luck had a lot to do with it, you know. It was just like the idea that I was excited about happened to resonate with other people, and uh, it, that you know that didn't necessarily have to be the case. No, absolutely, it happened that way. The idea of saying that you were looking for a business to start is intriguing. So that was at the time where you were doing a little freelancing work and discovering that it wasn't uh, it wasn't really your calling, or were you still with the theme business? That was the theme business, and that was um, I was ready to move on to other things, and um, quickly. So I was kind of like very, you know, I, I think I was I was doing some freelance work, kind of in the mid in betweens time, 
but I was like, I'm, I want to do another product business and I'm looking for an idea and I don't want it to be themes. And so, um, that's where, that's where sort of answer came from. Were there other ideas that you considered or really explored very seriously? Or was this like the first thing? <laughs> no, for sure. Like I, I thought of making a, a website that had a bunch of um, tutorials on it and uh, like doing some sort of other theme business. And I, I had other ideas that never kind of gained any traction, um, you know, in, in my thoughts. Um, but I, I definitely was like, like every night I would be just like, here's an idea. And I would write out like, how would this actually work? Like, okay, I think that's cool. But then I would wake up the next morning and I would be like, now nah, that idea is lame, you know? And like, <laughs> <laughs> and like yeah. I try to think of a new business. I get like so excited, like, oh, this is cool. This is going to be the one. And I wake up the next morning and be like, now nah, that idea is lame. So <laughs> I just kind of did that <laughs> yeah. for like a for months. And then, um, yeah, and then and then kind of at at, at the uh, word camp uh, when Matt Mullenweg was on stage at at uh, word camp San Francisco, and he would start talking about WordPress, and that's kind of where it it like bulb went on for me. Like apps, like he was more talking like like desktop and like apps sort of in the browser, but I saw mobile apps, and I kind of had just like an epiphany like this this is the one that I'm like super excited about and I'm going to do this idea and and it, and it was just totally different than all the other ideas I had had so that's amazing I wonder how many other businesses have spawned from ideas during a state of the word hmm. <laughs> just curious just do a poll do a poll of the audience yeah <laughs> yeah and uh, that that sounds like such an interesting and exciting time to be exploring new business ideas uh, like you were describing. I relate it very much to uh, my experience with musical composition and write, just writing songs. It, you set, it sounds great on uh, the first day. You say, I'm onto something. But the true yeah. test is when you try and play it again the next day. In the vast majority of stuff, you're going to say, actually, this kind of sucks. Uh, yeah. But every now and then, you're gonna play something the next day and you're gonna say, you know what, this is still good, this is a keeper. Yep. And that was App Presser. Yeah. So we've been alluding to it a little bit. Uh, maybe give us the the scoop for anybody maybe who's not used or had experience with App Presser. What is it? So I, I kind of lost your feed for a minute there, but you said, what is App Presser? Yes. Yeah. So App Presser helps you develop a mobile app for your WordPress website. And um, a lot of developers use it. Let's say you have a client who has like a restaurant and they and you built them a, a website for their restaurant in WordPress. And they come to you and say, hey, we want an app now. Um, so we specialize in taking your existing WordPress website, helping you translate all of that content into a WordPress, or, or sorry, into a mobile app for iOS and Android, and also add of extra features. So they say, hey, we want to do like um, online ordering through our app and it doesn't exist already. You can kind of, you know, like add WooCommerce to the website and you can do the online ordering through Work WooCommerce in the app. Or you can, um, they're like, hey, we want to add a social component to our like, like say you have an event website. We have an event and we want to add a social component to our app. Well, you can like use BuddyPress for that and it works on the website and the app and it's all the same database. and. So everything's all synced up together with WordPress, so you don't have to building everything in some sort of separate CMS somewhere else, or um, you know, making sure that all the content is synced, uh, you know, in sync and everything like that. Yeah, yeah. That, that's awesome. Uh, um, so yeah, and then you know, we have notifications where you can actually send pushes from WordPress based on events that happen in WordPress. So um, for example, like if you wanted to send a, a push notification every time a new post is published or um, every time, you know, like in BuddyPress when a private message is sent, that person gets a push notification or you can actually build custom events and send push notifications anytime you want, um, things like that. So give us a breakdown if you can why someone would really get excited about the app presser concept like who is this really for and i think it's a good illustration is helping uh, those who have not had much experience developing apps helping them understand what that experience is like without app presser 
Sure. Yeah, so App Browser is really for a, a web developer who doesn't have a lot of experience building mobile apps, but um, they can kind of add it as an, uh, sort of an add-on to their services and, and kind of make more revenue and give their clients something else that they want. Um, so you don't have to write any, you know, mobile app code. You don't have to um, know how to, you know, pull WordPress and display it, all that kind of stuff. Um, that's all handled for you. And we have a, a builder that allows you to build the app visually without actually um, writing a bunch of code. But then we also have a lot of ways where uh, people who are comfortable writing code could do a lot of customizations on the back end as well. Um, really, it's for the, the WordPress developer who's like, I don't know how to make an app, but my client wants one. It's, you know, just a really great way to get all your WordPress content into the app. And um, we focus on WordPress specifically, so <clears throat> we have deeper integration than any other app builder out there. If you go to another, app, you know, there's a lot of companies that make apps, but if you go to them and you say, "Hey, I want, I want to get like WordPress activity feed into my app," uh, I mean, that just that's not going to happen with with uh, you know other products. Yeah. So we really focus on like the hardcore WordPress stuff, getting it all into the app. Right. Yeah, that's pretty powerful. So maybe uh, the tell us a little bit about the early versions of App Presser. Uh, what you you saw the vision, you put something together. What did it look like, and uh, how was it received initially? Yeah. So, man, with the early early on with App Presser, when we started out. Um, we didn't really know how to do any of this stuff. We were just like, you know, I want to make a, a product to help people build mobile apps with WordPress, but we didn't know how any of it worked. And so our initial attempts at it were kind of naive. It was kind of like we were going to be building all this stuff from scratch, writing all this native code and doing all this crazy stuff, reinventing the wheel. Uh, so eventually um, we were like, wait, there's already frameworks out there that do all this stuff for you so we ended up <laughs> yeah yeah it's like it's like wordpress it's like you're, i'm going to build a, a php cms from scratch you're like why there's so many good ones out there already so um you know we ended up relying on uh, phone gap for the uh, native code integration JavaScript, and um that works fantastically and then also the ionic framework for the actual ui components in the app uh, <clears throat> Excuse me. And um, yeah, early versions, you know, we we uh, things were not as good as, and we've certainly come a long way. And then um, we started out with sort of a an an iframe wrapper around your website, and we would swap out the theme and and do some cool stuff. And uh, <clears throat> it was really really cool. suffered like performance and and uh, things like that. So. Uh, the version that we have now is actually just completely and totally different from the version one um, and, and better in, in every way. So it's, it's easier to build. The apps are faster and uh, the, the UI is better. And, you know, it, it's come a long way for sure. It really has. One thing I'm curious about is the reception and the reaction that, that you've gotten. Some, maybe share some of your experiences and maybe differences between the beginning and now, when I first encountered AppPressor, I pretty much got it. I was like, oh, this is really cool. I understand the value, I understand how uh, being able to avoid having separate silos of information or having to uh, write in these other languages, this, this separate application, just like bundle it from WordPress. Uh, that's pretty awesome, uh, but I'm, I would imagine You've had some people maybe who didn't get it, or does everybody? Um, yeah, I, I mean, our product is not for everybody. Like, um, there are <clears throat> if you're a hardcore mobile app developer, like there are you could just use a, a framework like Ionic, or you could use native code and you could make something yourself. Um, so our product is certainly not for that, that type of customer. Um, and then there are people who are like business owners and they don't even, they don't know how to barely put a WordPress site together. Like they're not really going to be able to put an app together because it's more complex than a website. Um, it's not really for them. For the, the, the guy who's kind of assembling the WordPress site or the developer of the WordPress sites, um, that it's put it together for them. So if we get that in that sweet spot of that person who kind of knows 
how to put some stuff together. Um, we've had a really great reception for Appressor 3, which just came out earlier this year. Uh, we have a lot of our customers who's actually been with us since version one, um, who have been telling us like, this is, this is it, like this is what we've been waiting for finally. Um, yeah. I, I, one customer told us he feels like Appressor has really reached its stride. And um, with this new product, I feel like that was a really good way of putting it. Um, so we're, we're really excited about the reception of it so far. Well, fill us in a little bit on AppPressor 3. What's, what's special about the AppPressor of today? Yeah, so uh, we basically, we kind of reimagined like everything about it, just kind of rebuilt the whole entire thing almost um, <clears throat> the way that we really wanted it, it to be. And um, so now we have a, a visual app builder where you can see your, uh, the preview of your app the entire time that you're building it. Um, we have integration with the WP API, um, which you know recently hit core, and uh, we have a lot more support for things like uh, like the performance is is incredibly improved. Um, we're using the Ionic two framework um, for all the UI components, which is just really really smooth and slick. And um, we have our own uh, push notifications API now, so you don't have to go pay another provider for your push notifications. Um, it's all included with AppPressor. And um, we have a, a great like app management dashboard now. It's it's more of like a software as service, but uh, it makes it a lot easier for people to to put together the apps <clears throat> because we can sort of help them in this hosted environment. Um, so yeah, it's uh, there's a lot better like offline support, and um, we're adding a lot of great new features as well. Man, that's pretty cool. Seems like a pretty mature product at this point which uh, really has found us fit in the market, uh, loyal audience, uh, good team. Maybe talk a little bit about uh, about the team that you have right now. I know a little bit of the background. You started this mostly solo. Is that correct? Um, no, actually, I have uh, my co-founders are uh, the owners of WebDev Studios, which is uh, Brad, Brian, and Lee. And um, so I started it with them. and. Um, They've definitely been a, a big help and, and um, have been with me since the beginning. Mm. Um, our team is, uh, besides us, <coughs> excuse me, um, we have now three support guys, um, Damien and, and Jamie. And then I have a, another developer whose name is Matt. And um, I handle a lot of the development as well. And then just all the miscellaneous things about day-to-day -day running the business. That's pretty cool. Are there any noteworthy competitors that you deal with or, or anything significant that you see as a threat to your growth? Um, as of right now, there, there's nobody like in our little WordPress niche who's uh, a, anyone that I see as a threat. There are certainly other companies doing similar things, um, but really we're kind of setting our sights on more like the, the bigger companies like Shoutem and Good Barber, and, um, the the sort of bigger non WordPress app builders, um, and and that's a really big space and it's difficult to kind of get into so or to do well in. Um, so we're doing really well in like the WordPress space, but to kind of expand beyond the WordPress space is definitely one of our goals. Um, although we haven't done that quite yet, so I couldn't tell you exactly how that's going to go, but. Um, yeah, that's that's kind of who I see as like our upcoming competition. Sure, pretty cool. Uh, it sounds like a tough challenge. Do you, do you have uh, anything to share that's going through your head a little bit about how you are going to accomplish that? How are you going to penetrate this kind of new bigger market? Yeah, so um, I think I think with niches is is the best way to do it. And so, uh, for example, if we were to say, go after just one niche first, be like, we want to go after restaurants and those restaurants don't necessarily have to be on word. So we just kind of say, Hey, we do restaurant apps really well. Um, that'll allow us to kind of focus in and we, we can figure out who our customers are and what they want instead of just being like, Hey, you can build you know, any app. Because then you have like just this nebulous customer who no idea what they want, 
how to market to them, things like that. But if you're like, hey, my customer is like a restaurant owner and he goes to these conferences and he goes to these websites and et cetera, et cetera, uh, then I know how to market to them and I know how to figure out what exactly they want in app. So that's that's kind of our plan. Um, although, you know, it's it is very difficult. So so we don't you know, I don't know hundred percent how that's gonna exactly flesh out. So Yeah. I was just curious a little bit. So the app presser business has uh, had some iterations over time. Tell us a little bit about your early model uh, for monetizing this product and what changes you went through over time to improve from a business standpoint. Yeah, so our pricing is is relatively similar. Uh, actually, it's, it's pretty much exactly the same as it was when we first launched. Um, our we sort of started out with a bundle based pricing <clears throat> where we had like a, a starter bundle for 199 and then some mid tier bundles and then we had an agency bundle for 499 um, and we actually still have the the starter and the agency bundle and and a mid tier bundle for 399 so i think that the the things that we've learned about that over time um, is that we we had an extension model where like easy just loads where you could you know buy these individual extensions and sort of piece them together. Um, we've since done away with that model. So even though we still sell multiple plugins in a bundle, we don't allow people to purchase them individually. You can only purchase a bundle. <clears throat> and I think um, if you've heard any of, of, of Pippin Williamson's talks recently, he talks about some of the downfalls of the extension model and. I think I sort of agree with that. <clears throat> it creates a lot of complexity, and it doesn't always translate into more profit. So the bundle model works really great for us. Um, one big change that we've done recently is uh, we've moved to recurring uh, uh, subscription-based pricing. So about a year ago, we started making all of our purchases subscriptions, and um, basically the, it auto-renews after a year. So this month, we've actually seen those revenues start to come in because it's been a year now. Um, and so that has definitely contributed to our to growing our bottom line. Um, <clears throat> so far, it hasn't been quite as incredible as we were hoping it would be, but it's, cert it's definitely significantly increased our renewals. Um, so that's been a that's been a huge help. Um, we're also working on some other, some new stuff for pricing, and um, we've, we're reducing our renewal discounts. And um, I think a theme that you'll see um, amongst a lot of product developers is that they're going to basically get rid of the renewal discounts altogether. Um, it's going to be recurring renewals, and it'll just be yearly pricing. <clears throat> it'll be like one ninety nine a year instead of like one ninety nine the first year, and then thirty percent off the next year, and things like that. That's an interesting prediction. Wow. It's, it's, well, I know for sure it's going to happen. I mean, it's not like a guess because I, I talked to all these guys, you know. Prior. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, that's kind of because the only, the only, I mean, nobody else does renewal discounts except for word plugin numbers. And so there's just really no reason to have them. Like your product's either worth the money or it's not. And taking, you know, 40% off <clears throat> doesn't really, it, it doesn't really matter if your product is useful to your customer. So um, that's definitely coming down the road. I think you convinced me I'm going to change my renewal rate right now. <laughs> but so that's, uh, that's pretty cool. So those are some lessons that you've learned a lot about renewals. Now that you've been doing it for a few years, uh, you know that there are a lot of challenges when you're just uh, relying on people to manually renew, no matter how many times you remind them with your emails. It's just not quite the same as setting up a subscription. So yeah, and um, we're, we've also moved to a software as a service model to where if you if you don't renew, then you don't have access to our app builder <clears throat> or our push notifications anymore. And so we have a unique advantage there, I think, as where we're we're providing value um, on a yearly basis that goes beyond just support and updates. I think another problem that plugin developers have is that support and updates are not necessarily valuable to someone a year after that project has finished. So they install your plugin, it works fine. If they stop, if they, if they um, don't pay you anymore, the plugin is still gonna work fine. And they're gonna get to do, they get all the value they already have. Um, Cause they don't necessarily need your support anymore. And they don't really hear updates because they don't really understand like security and things like that. 
So um, it's really difficult to get people to pay you money just saying like, hey, at some point in the future, this update may save your butt. <clears throat> um, they don't really see that Im immediately. So um, yeah. having a software as a service, is, it definitely adds a lot of value to the renewals. That's completely true. So you moved to that model, and the features that people get are the builder and the push notifications. How did you come to the conclusion that these are the things that we should offload to our service, and these are the things that will encourage renewals, and we have a justification for pulling them uh, onto our servers and and working it that way? Well, um, it was pretty easy for us because most uh, mobile app builders do this in some fashion. So just <clears throat> look at their model and, uh, you know, we're, and we're not doing anything groundbreaking. Um, but notifications, we were sending our customers to a third party provider and they would um, pay them $50 a month if they wanted a lot of extra features with their push notifications or they had a free tier as well. But um, so we thought, hey, they're paying somebody else $50 a month. If we bring this into our service, that effectively adds $50 a month in value to our product. And um, we're not actually charging $50 a month. We're not charging anything for our push notifications unless you want like advanced features. So for us, it, the push notifications are actually a way to encourage renewals and, and we make up the revenue that way instead of directly charging for them. So we figure, you know, we'll make X amount of dollars in extra renewals because we're giving them push notifications. Um, and so that's kind of where we're making our money on it instead of saying, hey, come pay us $50 a month extra for push notifications. Yeah. Cool. Awesome. So you speculate that this path that you have taken is something we're going to see more product developers in the WordPress space following suit. Yeah, I already know several people that are working on these behind the scenes. Um, they haven't announced them. <clears throat> so I know for sure it's it's coming down the road uh, for a lot of people. I think there's just a lot of advantages to recurring revenue and <clears throat> and hosting you know, a, a sort of SaaS model business. And a lot of people are just kind of going that way. It's just kind of the next step. Like if you have a seven figure business, the next step is to take it to figures the only way you're going to get there is by, you know, doing something a lot bigger, like making a SaaS model or whatever it is. <clears throat> sure. So. Hmm. Do you think, uh, uh, do you think it's going to take a long time for that transition or is it, is it happen happening rapidly? I think it's going to happen real fast. Like, like by the end of this year, there'll be at least a few new major uh, product developers that have, SaaS, uh, you know, businesses released. Um, so hmm. yeah, it's it's definitely the next step. I mean, like if you have a <clears throat> if you have some sort of plugin and you want to expand to a wider audience, you can't expand to a wider audience <clears throat> by building features in your plugin. You have to make it so that anyone can use it, and the only way to do that is by building a software service. So that way, you don't have to rely on just WordPress people. You you expand to, you know, WordPress is 26% of the internet, but there's a whole other, uh, you know, 74% out there. And so to get to that other 74%, you have to build a SaaS. So that's kind of what a lot of people are doing. Awesome. So say I own a, a WordPress product company right now, no SaaS offering whatsoever. I'm considering it. I'm thinking about it because I hear people talking about it and it sounds kind of cool. What are some of the pros and cons I should be uh, aware of as I go through that decision-making process? Um, so the first one is that when you build a software right now, instead of having one product that you're selling, you now have two products. You have the product that you're selling and then you have your software as service. And the software as service uh, app, let's call it, is a product to itself. So you have a payment system, you have, you know, email system, you have uh, onboarding that you have to do, you have hosting that you have to make sure is up all the time, you have all this user management, people are, you know, have to be, able, you have those documentation, some of that stuff translates from your other product into the software service, but a lot of it is, is completely new. Um, so you have to actually be managing that and, and making tweaks and improving your, your onboarding process and your UI 
on your UX and your design and all that stuff of your of your SaaS um, app. So that's that's a lot. And then um, recurring revenue, like if you start to charge monthly, it's a whole other thing than just a one-time fee. Uh, it's a, it comes with a whole boatload of other issues that um, you don't realize and. Um, one is that if you, let's say, instead of charging like $300 one time, you're going to charge like $50 a month. Well, you're going to have a lot of people who are going to uh, sign up for $50 and then cancel. They're going to stay a couple months, then their credit cards are going to expire. <clears throat> they are going to, um, you know, there's churn. Churn is is something that we don't really deal with as, as one-time pl plugin developers. It's like to grow your revenue, um, you have to be actively adding lots of users when you're charging a lower monthly fee. Whereas if you charge a, a large one-time fee, you get you can get a lot of revenue from a few customers if you're charging 500 bucks a pop. But start charging $50 a month, then all of a sudden you, you need to get a lot more customers to get back up to that same amount of monthly revenue. Um, and it, it's good over time because you can build that revenue up like a snowball, but in the short term, you you take, kind of take a hit. And so um, the other thing is, you, you let's say you charge um, $500 a year, and then you switch that and start charge $50 a month. Well, you have to make sure that, you're, that most of your customers start staying long enough to actually get to that $500 number that you got before. Because... If all of a sudden most customers only stay three months, now you're only getting $150 uh, of customer value instead of getting $500 of customer value. And um, so if you can't get them to stay long enough or longer than you got be them, a number that you before, then you're losing money by switching to recurring revenue. So um, there's a lot of things to think about. <laughs> <clears throat> so do you look at a lot of product companies that exists right now, say your run of the mill plugin shop or a theme shop, and have suggestions or ideas for them. They say yeah, that this is this is attractive. I think I want to go in this direction. It sounds smart, but I'm not really sure how. I'm not really sure what to offer to add to my business to make add the SaaS component to what I do. I sell a theme or I sell a you know just some functional plugin to customers. Is it even for me? Uh it, I mean, probably not. It, it could be, you know, anybody could do it. You don't have to already have a popular plugin, but I think it makes more sense if you already have an audience and you kind of know what they want, <clears throat> and then you can kind of extrapolate on that and say, here's what's going to work in a software service. Because one thing you definitely don't want to do is, is build this huge SaaS app and then have nobody pay you money because um, it's a lot of work to maintain it. You have to pay a lot in hosting fees and in like upgrades and bug fixes and maintenance and all that kind of stuff. And if you're not getting the money back um, to justify it, it's a lot harder to sunset a, a, a pass than it is to sunset a plugin. So mm. that. that's an interesting point. Cool. Okay, okay. So what is kind of like, what does the, the future look like uh, for AppPress or what do you guys got on the horizon and what are you really most excited about? So we have some really cool features coming up in the AppPress 3 product, um, like segmented push notifications, which you've been, a lot of you have been asking about. Uh, we're going to be adding in like um, some really cool analytic stuff. Um, and we, we have... Uh, Plans beyond that are a little too murky to, to be talking about. Um, but we're just going to work hard in kind of in improving our, our product and maybe work a little bit harder on our marketing than we have been. We do a lot of dev, but not a ton of marketing. Um, so I think that'll be cool. And then uh, maybe in the future, you know, created a whole new product um, that's, that's not maybe not necessarily, you know, related to apps. Um, I don't know. That's just kind of... <clears throat> maybe at some point would be fun to do. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, that's kind of a interesting prospect. So let's uh, let's talk about your schedule real quick. What's what's on the 2017 calendar? Where might somebody bump into you? I'm going to WordCamp San Diego on the 25th of March. I'm going to be at Pressnomics. <clears throat> which is early April. Uh, we're in Orange County, which is in June. 
and definitely WordCamp US. And uh, besides that, man, I um, maybe at the OC Word, WordPress meetup at some point, um, and hopefully some other WordCamps. Awesome, awesome. I see you're speaking at Pressnomics, a presentation titled, What I Learned From You. Can you give us a preview of what uh, what we're going to learn in that presentation? Yeah, so, uh, you know, I, I Josh asked me to do a lightning talk, and so I was trying to think of what to do for it. And, you know, at Pressnomics is a pretty, <laughs> it's some pretty heavy hitters there. So, I, you know, getting up on stage in front of these heavy hitters and <clears throat> trying to tell them something that they don't already know is pretty difficult. So instead, I'm just... <laughs> So, you know, it, it, instead, I'm just going to say, you know what, you guys are, are smarter than me, and here's some cool stuff I've learned from you. And, like, for example, I've learned from Corey Miller how a uh, big leader, you know, like what leadership looks like. And, um, uh, you know, I've learned from Tony Perez of, of Curie about, like, pricing, just kind of like um, own own thing and, and filtering out the noise. Um, and... I've learned a lot from Josh Treble about innovation. Um, and so I'm just going to kind of talk about a few different people that really influenced me and sort of what they've taught me. That sounds like an awesome presentation. Like uh, greatest hits of lessons learned in this community. Yeah, definitely. My presentation is a lightning talk and immediately precedes yours. It sounds oh. like I'm, I'm glad I don't have to follow you. <laughs> well, we'll see. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I'll get terrible. I'll get them warmed up for you. There you go. Uh, yeah. So uh, Pressnomics is an awesome event, and I think that's where I met you for the first time last year. Uh, how many times have you attended? Uh, I think this is gonna be my. How many have they had? This is the fifth one. I didn't go the first one, so this will be my fourth. Awesome, awesome. It's a pretty special event. It is. Uh, I really. I really enjoy it, and I think that uh, it's not something that you can really experience at, at many other events. So, uh, anything in particular for that uh, that week that's only that's coming up pretty fast uh, that you're really looking forward to? Um, I had a lot of fun golf last year, and um, so that I think that's going to be really fun. But I just love seeing you know meeting new people and then hanging out with all you know old friends and stuff and. A lot of cool people that go, a lot of uh, product businesses and a lot of really great just kind of hallway talk that, that goes on, very valuable networking and stuff. So. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's hard to beat the experience yeah. there when there's there's really practically no one in attendance who isn't all in, who isn't yeah. fully invested in this space. Yeah, that's funny. You, if you're if you're sitting there and like you don't know who the person is next to you, you can probably assume that they're like doing something really cool. Like yeah. <laughs> that's so true. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, sweet, sweet. Well, I really look forward to hanging out there in just a couple weeks. And uh, I know you're gonna you're this. Let's see, San Diego is this coming weekend, I believe. I think is it the twenty fifth this weekend? Yes, yeah. it is. Yeah. Well, it was uh, it was on my calendar, but uh, my situation changed, and I ended up going to Miami instead. So that's where I'm going to be. Cool. Well, Brian will be there, so he's doing a talk on App Presser. Oh, sweet! That's right. There's there's going to be a lot of people there. It's WordCamp Miami, folks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, um, kind of uh, winding down here. Uh, are there any good suggestions that you have for guests that I should invite on the show in the future? Uh, have you had Tony Perez on? Oh, I haven't had Tony yet. I would definitely get Tony on. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That's a great, great suggestion. Okay. So um, before we wrap up, is there anything else that you would like to share about the future or anything you would like to encourage people to check out? Parting words of wisdom. And lastly, how people can get in touch with you if they're so inclined. Oh, man. Um, you know, I, I don't have much wisdom except that I kind of feel like my business has been just a series of like trial and error and uh, with a lot of errors. And uh, so if you're if you're out there trying stuff, uh, you know, keep trying stuff, keep failing, and getting back and, and trying other stuff because I really feel like that's the best way to go about it. Um, as far as getting in touch with me, I'm on Twitter at Scott Bollinger. Um, at Presser is Presser.com. Awesome. 
Well, uh, thanks everybody for tuning in and thanks especially Scott for joining me for episode 136. It's been an awesome discussion and I hope you have a great evening. Thanks for having me. Awesome. Catch you later.